Hello and welcome to Dear DSA and my name is Bami Shai Victor, live from the city of Kyiv in Ukraine and uh, I want to take a minute to apologize for coming on late today uh, and uh, I hope we accept our apologies and we can have a very wonderful time today. I remember last week Facebook was down and uh, we had to go on uh, live only on uh, YouTube, but this week we are we're on both Facebook and YouTube. So I want to say welcome to everyone of you who has come in, uh, who is on now, both on uh, Facebook and on YouTube. Welcome and uh, thank you for always joining us. And today we'll be having a very interesting conversation. I'm sure some of you are already seen uh, the topic on the screen, uh, but it will be a very interesting one. Uh, as of now, I'll just go on Facebook and try to see those who have joined us and try to welcome uh, you. And as I do that, I also encourage you to please go ahead and share uh, to the different platforms uh, that you are on, the different fora uh, where you engage, and invite your friends also. And uh, <coughs> I can see that uh, Ms. O Tony Origbo has joined, Ms. Ufoma Anigoro, Dr. Lubumi, I can see you, Ifegu Ude, Tony Olobayo, Vike Suleiman, I can see Bishop Akintola, you're very much welcome. And for all of you who are joining in, I can see Blessing Akpobari, I can see Njoka Boon, you're very much welcome. And as you're coming in, please don't forget to go ahead and share. Today, Facebook is, is on, thank God. <laughs> and uh, you, you can share now. Last week, you, we didn't have the, the privilege to do that. Uh, but this week, uh, things have uh, gotten better and that's the beauty of life that things we hope always get better so uh, what are we going to talk about today we're going to talk about um, the Nigerian election and uh, we've been talking about that for about three weeks now and different facets of it uh, from uh, the predictions to the aftermath and then we talked about those who said God spoke to them and uh, we uh, the, the end does not justify uh, the means. Uh, so we can now see clearly uh, who God is speaking to and who God is not. Uh, in, while some of us on the medical aspect uh, may want to advise those who claim God spoke to them and we see that God did not speak to them to go check themselves for some auditory hallucination. It could be some psychotic uh, syndrome. We don't know, but uh, it may be very advisable that they go for medical checkup. Uh, because when you begin to hear voices uh, that ends up not being God's voice, uh, in the medical side, it's a dangerous one. Uh, so I can see uh, Abiola Olojo Daniela Diogu has also joined. I can see Prince Debola Shongbadebo, Vinda Kelo, Idara, I'm completing him. You're very much welcome. Thank you for liking my outfit. <laughs> All right, so I have a guest on the show today. Uh, you know him is my partner in this in this business and this uh, <laughs> to some other people they will call it crime but well we are sure it's not a crime uh, but if that's how they will take it until the truth goes in and um, but we try to be as objective as possible of course we understand a lot of people have their biases uh, we do not deny in some certain aspect for me as a person I know I do have mine too uh, but within every ambit of trying of everything it means to try. I try my best to be objective. And that's why I tr we try to work with data. I will try to show you uh, objectively and empirically uh, what we are talking about. So that's why we show you videos, we show you statistics, we show you figures, we show you even uh, sometimes write-ups uh, so that you can see that we are talking on the base of facts, not just this, this is not sentiment. Uh, and that is not to say that I, as a person, Bamishai Victor, do not have my biases. Of course, I do. That's what it means to be human. But what it means to, to be even more human is the ability to learn, to unlearn, and then to relearn. So it means you have to be open enough to listen to what people have to say and the objectivity uh, that may back it up. So without further ado, let me bring on my guest, my, my partner on the show today. Uh, it's not a person than Dr. Sunday Adelaja. Dr. Sunday, good to have you again. <laughs> my, my pleasure. My pleasure. Yeah, so I was talking about uh, psychosis earlier on. Uh, you know, in, in psychiatry, especially when you're talking about um, uh, psycho psychosis, uh, people 
tend to report hearing voices. Uh, so we also take into Hallo cognition Hallucinous, hallucination. hallucination. We also take into cognition religious factors. So there's something called the religious delusion. Uh, but on that end, when someone says yes, God, and uh, it turns out that the result came out now and there God, was no God. There was no God. Uh, we, we, it's, it, it makes us begin to suspect that that has to be some auditory hallucination. So we need to ask now, uh, that voice, how did you hear it? Is it outside? You know, if it's outside and you can probably see the person who you say is talking to you, then if the person is old enough, we may start suspecting dementia. So it may seem that those who were actually accusing Buari of dementia, eh? <laughs> they may actually be the ones suspecting, uh, be the ones suffering from it. Now, if the voice is, if they say it's inside them, maybe they hear it inside their head or they feel it in their tummy or something like that, then it's called pseudo hallucination. In any case, when voices are heard and there's no evidence to prove it, and especially uh, the result, and reality does not back up that claim, it's time to begin to suspect uh, psychosis. So I don't know if you use your, uh, your voice to please beg them, those who may eventually watch. Uh, to, I don't know how many mental health facilities are in Nigeria, but of course we need to um, uh, give awareness about that. Maybe they need to check in into one and and get, get help. My own problem is, how do I connect that with today's topic? Uh, we'll connect it. We'll co <laughs> we, are, we, we have to know where we are coming from to know where we are going to. <laughs> but in any case, we've been talking about Nigeria's election and, uh, you know, a lot of people prophesied. And one of the prophecies was that uh, Buari was not going to win or Atiku was going to win. And someone said God told them. Many of them, in fact, even prayed after God had even told them. And uh, I read last week of one of them saying that the election was rigged and that's why the prophecy did not come true. So, and we did last week that uh, who is the God uh, that told you that uh, Bari was not going to win but did not factor in rigging. So that's where that is coming from. That now that the people say they heard God and the result don't come out now. Well, Atiku did not win. So it means God did not speak to them. So they may need to go check that. Now, but coming to today, how do we link it to today? Yes. Today we want to talk about... <laughs> uh -huh. So this rigging, where we not talk about go -go, who rigged? So this rigging that you said is the reason why your prophecy did not come to pass. Who is responsible for it? So today's question is who rigged the Nigerian elections? Okay, I think personally thinking, I think when you talk about developing countries like Nigeria, it is uh, impossible to exclude the factor of rigging altogether, totally. There are some countries that have managed to achieve that feat, but Nigeria is still far away from that. And we still have to unfortunately admit that most likely there were factors of rigging in Nigerian election as well. Uh, including it coming from both sides. So to be, to be uh, crying foul when you yourself you are engaged in the same activities is like the proverbs that is popular from my side of the country. I think it's all over Nigeria that if you don't catch a thief on time, the thief will begin to shout at the owner of the farm that the, the owner of the farm yeah. is the thief. Yeah. I did the mole. <laughs> Ole mo loco. Yes, that's it. I did the mole. Ole mo loco. Right, that's yes. the way it is in Yoruba language. That if you don't catch the, if the owner of the farm does not catch that declare and raise alarm against the thief on time, the thief will begin to <laughs> raise the alarm against the farmer, against the, farmer, against the owner. So you will be catching the owner, the, calling him the thief, <laughs> just because the guy was not. So it's, and why is it that it's the thief that raises the alarm? Because he doesn't want to be, the, to be caught. So I, it's almost like that kind of proverb, that uh, people who are really engaged in this are the ones who are, you know, are shouting the most. I personally think that um, when it comes to rigging, I don't think anybody could be uh, acquainted uh, from that crime in Nigeria in terms of the two political parties. However, when you look at the figures very well, I begin to doubt that 
the main rigging in Nigeria election was perpetrated from the north. <clears throat> I have more doubt about that because the followership that Buhari has in the north, they are more cult followership. Or what do you call it? A cult followership, yeah. Yeah, it's a cult followership, which means they are more dedicated followers who are ready to go and vote and fight for their rights and for their vote in the north than any other candidate who in Nigeria. Yes. So, but when you now look at the candidate of uh, PDP, I don't think he has that kind of court followership. And it's also from that north. And even though it's from that same north, it doesn't have the court followership in the north, and I don't think he has it even in the south. And I think that uh, the, the, the people who are voting for PDP are mostly people who are not happy about APC or about uh, Buhari. So it's more about grudges votes. So it's not like a dedicated followership kind of commitment. And that is why I say that who will then probably rig? The people who are already fanatical about a candidate, they will, never, they will not need to rig because they are going there to vote anyway. Because they are already fanatical about it. Yeah. The ones who will rig are the ones who are more, you know, who are not so satisfied. And, but still, I think that rigging might be happening in the two places. But it will be wrong to just accuse one party of rigging. Yeah. Uh, like you said, rigging is a factor uh, that cannot be excluded uh, in the Nigerian politics. And all, in fact, in many developing nations. In fact, even in developed nations, uh, there is always the tendency for the politician to always do uh, what whatever he can, everything possible to rig the election to his favor, to, to get uh, the election to his favor. So uh, to now bring it down to, to environments such as ours, which is very undeveloped, and sometimes, unfortunately and sadly, uncivilized, where uh, things that are norm are not being followed, uh, where people still behave, uh, as badly as should not be seen amongst uh, civilized people, then you already know, of course, it is a factor. And it's, it's sad that it's the reality, but of course, that is what it is. And if we have to, in fact, move on from it, we have to discuss how do we stop it really. And so to now talk about today's topic, who rigged the Nigerian elections? We have to look at facts and analysis. We have to look at, for instance, let's look at how, did the, how has the numbers been over the years till 2019. Then we'll see, was it rigged? How much did rigging affect uh, the political reality? And those are the uh, discussions and those are the conversations uh, we, should really, we should really have. Uh, if you look at, for instance, in America, as civilized as it is, you may think that rigging doesn't go on, but if you study them very well, you know how much and how they do their rigging, from uh, voter suppression to even manipulating uh, the electronic voting. And you see, well, electronic voting is one of the things I would also like us to talk about today, because on the surface value, people think, some people think, that just electronic vo uh, voting will solve the problem of rigging. Well, maybe it will. Uh, maybe it won't, but uh, those are the things uh, we would uh, talk about today. So, DSA, uh, I don't know if uh, DSA would want to uh, talk now about, we should talk a little bit about the cult followership uh, that Buhari has. Does his uh, nearest opponent have the same? Then we'll talk again about who are those that are claiming that the elections have been rigged. Uh, is it just the main opposition party? Or do we have uh, other people who also are saying this election is being rigged? For instance, uh, this new uh, generation parties who are just coming up, the likes of uh, uh, the very respected uh, Shuare, the very respected Mogalu, and uh, Feladro Toya, are they also claiming that the election is being rigged? Then those who are claiming the election is, has been rigged or is rigged, what are they doing about it? Are they going to challenge it? Then these are uh, things that I would really want us to talk about today. Yeah, you just spoke about talking from figures and yes. from statistics. Yes, sir. So, uh, what's more of a slide, I forgot. I would like us to look at the statistics and the picture of Nigerian electoral participation yes, and how the picture of 
you know, Nigerian voting system is. The figures from what section of the, yeah, of 2019, from what section of the country, so that we could analyze and really see uh, how, the whole, what, how the whole thing looks like. And then we'll be able to come to the conclusion that is it that, uh, is, where is the possibility of rigging more likely and where it is less likely? Let's have a look. Because we've got to see what was more what's it what's more of a slider. Sea freight, I'm the sea freight say. Sorry guys. Yeah, so we'll be looking at uh, the statistics. Uh, state, uh, that will be region by region, and then we'll look at the numbers. What does it say? And uh, what is the possibility or the likelihood of voting or of vote rigging in such places? And you know we have to put into factor the fact that uh, card readers are substantially being used uh, in this election more than it was before. So of course that, to a large extent, maybe not of course not absolutely, but to a large extent, has been able to uh, to remove a voter fraud to a large to a very large extent because you have to go through accreditation uh, before you get to vote. And we also. Of course, I don't know if the numbers are here, but you know that there are people who lost in their awards and their awards and local governments where it was clear who carried the day before a co co uh, coalition uh, took place. So then the question will be, where was this, uh, where did this rigging take place? So uh, yes, the numbers are, are here on the screen. Okay, vote analysis says, let's, let's look at vote, votes by zone. Yes, sir. So Southwest voted 2.2 point, 2 million, let's say 2 million votes for APC. Yes, sir. And PDP is 1.7 million. No complaints coming from Southwest. Why not? Uh, I think because when the election happened in Ekiti, there was complaint. Yes. When the election happened in Oshun, there was complaint. But now that they want Oyo and Ondo, and Ondo nobody is complaining. What's the problem? In fact, I saw articles coming from people, even PDP people, uh, like the guy was the sports, uh, spokesman for Jonathan. Who, no, no, no. Who is in America now? Reno. Reno, Reno. Reno voted and said that it's impossible to, I mean, he wrote an article and said it is impossible to count Yorubas as against Igbos. Mm -hmm. Because how can they leave their son, or Shibajo, who is the vice president currently, and go and 50% of the vote, almost 50% of the vote, go and give it to Peter Obi. Peter Obi, who is Igbo. So how can you understand that? They, they said, so he was saying that it's not possible to say Yorubas are, are yes. tribalists yes. and that they are the most uh, tolerant and welcoming tribe in Nigeria. And that for them, the fact that they have given 50% of their vote, almost 50% of their vote, to somebody from not coming from their side, about for, for Peter Obi yeah. means that there is no you know no discrimination. So they were rather praising. But apart from him, I also saw somebody else. I think I think no Obi himself, Peter yeah. Obi, saying Southwest is the most civilized part of Nigeria. Mm. If everybody is like that, you know there will be no problem. So but the the same people were complaining. When it didn't go their side, yeah, we took Kiti and Osho. How do you, what is happening? In fact, by the time we go to the north. You will see, I'll, I'll, I'll say something when we go to the north, but you will see again why it is just plain hypocrisy. Plain hypocrisy on the part of, especially those who are PDP apologists or those who just don't like Buhari and the APC. So what happens is that the election is always credible whenever and wherever PDP wins. wins. But it is never credible anywhere APC wins. So that bias that many people bring into the, into the picture is, 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 is what leads to the hypocrisy of, of never complaining when they win, but when, when it doesn't go their way, always talking. For instance, okay, why is it then that if that is the theory you are saying, but they are not complaining about Lagos too, even though they lost in Lagos, but they lost in Lagos, you know, even greater, more number than ever before the governorship something and they're not even the guy goes to leave the party the yes. governorship candidate yes. Yes. but then when the internal party apc party primaries was going on 
PDP was saying that was rigged, even, even among themselves, yes. even though it doesn't concern them. Yeah. But now that they lost, they are not complaining about Lagos. Yeah. In this case, it was very clear. Uh, the gap is too much. The gap is too much. And uh, you can see, the, especially within the Southwest, and like I said, this card reader issue that was brought reduced voter fraud to a very large extent. So, and of course, votes are collated word by word, and that does not mean it could not be rigged, but when you, you are the uh, word agent and you can see the number coming from your word, you can see the number coming from the local government, so it was very clear. And it seems to me that people in the Southwest seem to be uh, politically tolerant enough. And I think politics has matured to a large extent in the Southwest. Yeah, what surprised me in the Southwest the most in this election was the uh, Ogun State. Yeah. Because the Ogun State, what happened there was totally mind blowing. The governor, which, who, who was APC governor, went ahead, went ahead and rebelled against his own party. And he managed to win. A senatorial seat for himself but then when it comes to bringing in his own governor you know even though the people voted for him the same people went and voted against him when it comes to the governor yeah. that is that is talking about a whole lot of maturity going on there yes so people understand better even though he they, the same people voted for him to be a senator but when it comes and they voted for Buhari yes and then, but when it comes to the person, the guy, the whole reason why he, he actually created his own party yes. was to bring his own governor. Yes. The people, maybe they took his money, maybe they took his rights, but they voted against his candidate. Yeah. And uh, considering that he had already split the number of even the party, because he, you know he's, he was a stakeholder, uh, of course he's still a stakeholder, so it means he took a lot of APC people even to APM. But even at that, the people knew that this is who we want, it's not you, it's not your stooge. And so they voted against such. Of course, there are a lot of factors also to consider the political heavyweight uh, that are also against him, uh, people like uh, Because the normal Toshoba. thing that would have happened, if he had splitted the two votes of APC like that, yes. the normal thing that was supposed to have happened is that that party was supposed to lose out. Yes. And it's supposed to be the emo scenario. Yes. Because the same thing, similar thing happened in yes, Imo. Imo. They split the votes of APC and both of them became yes. the losers. Yes. So, but what had happened was if, if, he was, if he didn't do that and create APC, uh, APM, APM, APC would have won by a wider margin in that state. In that state. By, wide, by, by quite a lot. Because if you look at, his party was even number two. So it's a good thing that they are sanctioning him. Yes, very because what he has involved in is blatant acti anti-party activity. activity, and it's not good for any democracy. But why is it that Nigerians seem to dislike or even hate Oshomole? But I think that guy is one of the best things to happen to Nigerian politics. Yes, especially him becoming the national chairman. Chairman, yes. But why is it that the criticism against, in fact, criticism against him is more than the criticism against Buhari? Well. Uh, sometimes, in fact, it's all crazy. It might even be more than Oporosha. Yes, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because, even people from his state they hate him. No, I don't. I don't think the oh, people a from a lot state. of people from his state. That's why his state lost the something almost to president special mm -hmm. votes to Atiku almost. No, oh. that, that in that case, it's it, that scenario is a south south. Um, no, but if you are the if the governor is APC, and if the you know he, this former governor was APC, is the national chairman. I mean, he was supposed to deliver his state. If he cannot deliver his state, they don't like him. And I see criticism from people of Edo. They they hate the guy. I don't know why. They say he didn't do anything. He didn't deliver. That's what I keep on hearing. The problem with <laughs> delivering, I don't know if it's something to talk about now. But one of the edicts that governors in Nigeria always have is the dichotomy of projects or salary. And that's, of, of course, no, because but of that lack of state leadership. Has paid salary. Yeah, he's always paying salary. Yeah. So with that, so why he's is not he able then, to do as much projects. Why is it the state didn't support him? It's a shame. 
I don't know. I, I, maybe that would be something. It's a shame to that he didn't deliver. But personally, I think the value systems he is bringing to Nigerian politics is exactly what is needed. It's the values he's advocating for that is what makes the West what the West is mm. now. To stand against the uh, impunity. Uh, impunity of the power, what do you call them? Kingmakers. Kingmakers. Yeah. And the big money, money bags or money yeah, wings, you call yeah, them. Yeah. The money big bags. Yeah. Yes. And he is standing for principles. He is going from the polity of sentiments to polity of principles. Yes. And he is going from money, money back um, politics into politics of party discipline. Yes. That is exactly what it's supposed to be. But even in his own party, people don't like him. Uh, I don't know how, how, how many people don't like him in percentage, no. but okay. substantially a lot of governors and stakeholders don't like him, uh, like you said, because he stood against their impunity. Okay, look at Ogun State, for instance. Why did the governor go away? He wanted to become, he wanted, he was scheming, according to what I found out, he was scheming to become the speaker, Senate president, number one, then the Southwest leader of the party. So that was his old scheme. And using, he was trying to use his closeness, personal closeness, with okay. worry to do that. So in his own state now, he wants to become a kingmaker. So what did that mean? He wanted to choose the three senators, the six federals of reps, and all of the uh, House of Assembly, not putting into consideration other political heavyweights that was there. And in 2011, when he became governor, Tinobu had to fight with his own uh, friend to make that guy governor. Oshoba had to leave the party then to join SDP because, uh, Mo, because he did not support Amosu becoming governor. But Tinobu said, this is the guy that can win as of this time. So they brought him in. And that was under ACN then, while they were still trying to take over the, the South. The same Amosu revolted now against, revolted against Tinobu. Tinobu. So Oshomole coming in and I saying, no, you cannot dictate everything. It, it's, you have to be able to lose some to win some. So you either go for Senate or you're going or you want governor. The same thing with Imo State. Your son-in-law cannot be governor and you will also be senator. So you either let him be governor. And you are the former and, governor. Yeah. And then, <laughs> and then you, you leave the Senate. And your wife is the happiness. And the sister is the happiness commissioner. Commissioner for happiness. Is it the sister? Yeah. Or, or, okay. No, that, that in itself is very innovative if Nigeria was ready for that. Because other countries so, are. Other, yeah, some countries like Saudi Arabia has. But is it the only sister in the country? <laughs> <laughs> so, or in the state? So that nepotism of and the greed was what Oshiomole was fighting. So the, the stuff was, you either forfeit your senatorial ambition and let your son-in-law be governor. Or you go for your senate and let them, you know, because it's a party, a lot of interest are involved. But he wanted everything to himself. And so that's where party supremacy comes in. If it was under John Odige Oyegu, everything would have they gone. They would have gone that yeah. way. So that's why I'm saying that what he is introducing to Nigerian polity is supposed to be celebrated, but instead, he's being ridiculed. Well, I don't know the number of people who are who are ridiculing it, but in the nation in general, well, a lot of people. If all the PDP are ridiculing, yeah, possibly because that's their job. Or and even part but within of APC, the, also they are apart from those who themselves are aggrieved. The general consensus within the party, they like what I, he's doing. I think that the only, well, actually, APC is only who is standing largely thanks to the reputation of Buhari. Buhari. Yeah, for sure. If it is, if, if they, that Oshimolo has been left alone without Buhari to handle that party, they would have fought him dirty.